when the children have to sit, I actually, I mean, in uh, Unbake the Fire, I tell the story of how these boys had to sit in their seats from 8.30 in the morning until lunch. They got a 30 minute lunch and then back in their seats. And if you couldn't take it, then they said, that's why they sent them to the principal's office. I worked with a public school in Detroit for three months. And when I got there, there was a whole line of boys going to the principal's office. And the first thing I did was to rewrite the teacher's schedule so that it incorporated all the time they were to spend on the curriculum. I had a person from the Waldorf School come in and teach the teachers opening exercises for the children. And the opening, because you know the children come on the, the buses or people are driving them, they don't walk to school like I used to do. When you walk to school, it gets your blood going to your brain, it gets you more mental acuity, and so the children need to wake their brains up. So they have activities that are physical and mental. That, the ch that I had them teach them, so they did that in the morning when the children came in. The children gave no recess whatsoever. I instituted recess. I then had them carve out a period in the afternoon around 2, 2.30, where they did in they had 20 minute periods to do indoor games with the children that were physical in nature. Mm -hmm. And I had workshops on how they could do this. And we rearranged some of the classrooms. And do you know the, the lines were gone? Children getting sent to the principal's offices are gone. I mean, when it comes to black children, people are not looking at developmentally appropriate practices. Uh, they're not looking at the children's rhythms. They're not evaluating, they're not understanding the children are misbehaving because the instruction is boring and mind numbing. So these are the kinds of things that are incorporated into that first circle. Um, and I, of course, highlight for you some of the, that's kind of the highlights of the things I've talked about. Now, this circle is really interesting to me because I've already laid the ground foundation for it. Ooh, it's one o'clock already. <laughs> I've laid the foundation for it in talking about the infrastructure. And so, this is an attempt for me to talk about how we can construct an instructional accountability infrastructure within the school that delivers academic excellence to black children. In the schools where you have white families, it's the white mother that does it. In the schools where you have the rich people, it's the tutors that do it. Those things aren't going to work. Well, the tutoring will. I do have tutoring up here. And I think that's essential because one of the issues that we have pondered and tried to address is why it is black children terminate their science and math once they move beyond where it's required. And now I have a son that's gone through that. Now I know. It's because nobody can pay for the tutoring. And the tutoring is not available. And the tutoring is necessary. And uh, one of the things that I propose is we have to think through how, oh, that's another uh, function of my Educational Aid Society. I forgot about that. Tutoring, you know. And what I want to do is provide tutoring for children uh, on a sliding fee scale or something that is affordable. And that to me is the frontier for how we're going to move children to that next level. And like I said before, Anybody who asks me who's going to pay for the tutoring, who's paying for the basketball, who's paying the, for the y same room that they have with these boys playing basketball where they're going no place fast, they use those same rooms for tutoring. Uh, peer tutoring within the building, uh, one of the things that in the schools where my son has gone, in the, they have what they call community duty. And that means when the children in the elementary school get to fourth and fifth grade, they are required to identify 45 minutes a week donated to community duty. And those children tutor younger children. When they get to the middle and high school, the high school students are required to uh, donate time for community duty and they have a resource room. And you can come in before school, after school, or during your break and get free tutoring from the high school students. At the school he's at now, they have what they call 
white points, I think. And everyone has to fulfill so many hours of it, and that's used for tutoring. I spoke to an inner city uh, middle school, and I asked them if they have anything like that. They looked at me like I was crazy. Well, why, why can't in the public schools we institute something like that, where tutoring is more readily available? Um, I just want to say a word about that slice up at the top, where it says, in loco parentis committee in every classroom. All right, we talk about leave no child behind, okay? Well, this is an idea that I have um, that puts that structure in the school, all right? I'm talking about the creation of a committee in every classroom that's called the in loco parentis committee, all right? And then, of course, you know that's Latin for in place of the parents, all right? This is for the child whose mother you've never seen, whose father is on crack, who doesn't sign the progress reports, is not intervening in that child's failure at all. All right, you get the month of October to evaluate the child and ascertain that the child is at risk for not being on grade level. This committee would be made up of another first grade teacher. I think it's important to have teachers in the building consulting with each other around children's success. You have a member of the community. Oh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. In my model, one of the key points of it is every school is adopted by a church. And the purpose of the church adoption is to bring in workers, not to teach the children anything about religion, but to bring volunteers who come in and help with the mission of the school. So the church would supply a person to serve on this committee. So you have the first grade teacher who's in the classroom, another one, a representative from the community, which comes from the church, and one parent in the classroom. The reason you have a parent is that parent might know the family and say, well, you know what, you can't really work with his mother, but his grandmother is the salt of the earth, or an older brother, or an uncle. I taught his older brother, and that's the person we need to tap to help him, okay? This committee basically makes an IEP, which is, if this child is not on grade level, then they create a plan for what kinds of supports will be put into place for this child over the course of this year to assure that by May that child is on grade level. That's what I'm talking about. And then, you know, I always say to teachers, we have the only profession where half of your class can fail and you get a raise the next year, okay? This provides the principal with a vehicle for penetrating that classroom. The principal can sit down with the teacher and say, okay, this child is not on grade level. Where, where is the in loco parentis report on this child? What have you structured? What has worked? What have you done? One of the problems we have is teachers, in my opinion, have too much authority to let children fail, to retain them, to socially promote them. Um, you know, one of the principles I talk a lot about is the, t the principal has to be an instructional leader. Because the experience I had in raising my son, I, I had a superintendent say this to me and another assistant superintendent in another school district, this is what they said. If you were in my school district, I would just route you through my good teachers. That's what I do for my school board members. Is that school reform? Is that school reform? I mean, a lot of it is who you get. The luck of the draw. And it shouldn't be an obstacle course where you got to wade through and find these people. The principal is the person who's supposed to be the equalizer to assure that quality services are delivered to all children. So that's just one example uh, in that. Now I want to say one other word about the last circle before I close. And I will sum this one up by saying there are things that middle class children get in their homes, in their communities, that everybody needs. And I want to redefine the role of the school as a coordinator of services. Uh, remember when I said the family has changed and when you're dealing with at-risk children, the school's got to change. So the school has to meet the family. And we haven't done that. 
We have an Ozzie and Harriet school, but we don't have the Ozzie and Harriet family. The children who don't come from the Ozzie and Harriet family fall through the cracks. So this is an example of what I'm talking about in terms of the school accommodating to meet the needs of the children. I mean, I know with my son, I spent all my life running him around to different kinds of enrichment activities, and I wasn't the only one there. When I got there, it was filled up with a whole bunch of other middle class people racing their children around for experiences. And the children who are not getting that have got to be provided that by our society. And so I am suggesting that this is a role that the school should take and its place in this circle. Now, I'm just going to give you, uh, we have mentoring of males. The churches now, the black churches, are creating male mentoring programs. I want to show you how that goes in the school. If you have a classroom teacher, if you have um, a principal, or you have a superintendent, they could do it at whatever level. All right, if I'm a classroom teacher, I can ask every one of the mothers in my room who's raising a child without a man in the home to give me the name of her pastor. And then I look and see how many pastors are represented in my classroom. Then I have a coffee where I invite these pastors to come. And I give them a profile on what the issues are with the black males, their achievement profile, where they need to go, where they need support. If you have something like a gang problem or anything, you go over that. You give this pastor, okay, you have three boys in my room who go to your church. Can you identify three decent men who can serve as a tutor for each of these boys, or a mentor, rather, for each of these boys? All right, you get the boys, the, the, two, the mentors generated. Then you have a coffee with the pastor and with the male mentors, and you structure a relationship with them, something they do with the boys, because it has to be structured. It's been tried when it wasn't structured, and it's almost comical. I mean, it's like the mentors start picking what mother they want to know. All that kind of stuff. I know it by church. This man has followed me out of the church trying to mentor my son. He was only three. <laughs> And I, told, I said to myself, like, they need to go mentor some of these 16-year-old boys on the way to prison. And, I mean, for me, to hand my son to somebody when he's three years old was hard, you know, the thought of it. But you know how you have to structure it, because I've heard instances where it didn't work. But you structure it, and the point of it is we may not be able to hire black men to come in as teachers, but we can bring them in through the back door in some enterprise like this. So that if a child is being sent to the principal's office, instead of just calling his mother, who just got off the bus after scrubbing floors, you call his pastor, you call his mentor, and you bring some black males at, to the school to try to get him straightened out. And I know I've used this with my son. Uh, every single step, I got a black male babysitter for him when he was six and David was 13. And David would help him put his toys together on Christmas or Christmas Eve, help him when he had a birthday party put the things together. I didn't want to do that. Help him with video games because he couldn't read, you know. And uh, then when he was four, in the fourth and fifth grade, David became his tutor in physics and chemistry. And David taught him how to ride his bike. David taught him how to rollerblade. Uh, you know, so he became a big brother friend. And then when we started doing basketball, I got uh, males that I paid to train him and work with him on skills. And so, you know, I have used a, a coterie of black males who have helped me with different aspects of his development. And we can do the same thing with volunteers in the school. Um, the last thing I want to say, this is my little pet project that is still in my mind. I hope one day I can do it. The word says parent organization that plans enrichment activities for children. Uh, how many of you have heard of Jack and Jill? Okay. Now, I remember Jack and Jill, and I quit every other day. <laughs> I'm almost out, and I can't wait this year to get out. And there's a lot of problems with it, okay? But the concept is a good concept. You know, the concept gets destroyed, but it is a good concept. And this is what I want to do. I want to create an organization like that in the school. And I even have a name for it. Oh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's an African-American organization started in 1937. 
it's the membership is made up of mothers uh, the children are from 2 to 18 and it was kind of designed for situations where, I don't know how it was designed for, but what it works for is if your child goes to predominantly white school, it gives a socializing vehicle for the black middle class where your children can meet other black children, engage in activities with them. So we have one activity a month. The children are divided into six different groups driven by age groups. And the mothers meet once a year and we plan an activity a month that we take our children on that's an enrichment activity and is funded with our own money. Well, the concept for me is, and I, the name I have for it is Crystal Stair. From Langston Hughes' poem, Mother to Son, Life for Me Ain't Been No Crystal Stair. And that this, every child in the school would automatically be a member. And the mothers would get together, be divided into cohort groups, and they plan the activity. And it gives, you know, how one of the things I talk about in my book is inside the school, everybody is a part of the family. And outside of the school, everybody is a part of the village. And so this activity, in my mind, is a uh, help in creating a sense of family within the school so that it helps the mothers get to know each other because they plan and execute the activities together. It helps the children get to know the mothers. Uh, I can't go this time, but could you pick up my son and I'll drop your child off next time? And you have that kind of interchange. It orients the parents into how to plan enrichment activities for their children. And when you get it down with the first one, you get better at it with the ones that come along subsequently. And I know, just to give you an example, the kinds of our, ca our um, activities are categorized so that we were supposed to do one that's social, one that's recreational, one that's civic, uh, religious. We have different categories, so you can construct the categories. I did an activity where we came over to Michigan State where they have what they call VETA Visit. And the School of Veterinary Science converts their entire building uh, to you know a, a showcase where you come through and learn about the different animals and it's something that if you're three years old you're going to take from it they have animals to pet uh, if you're a 12th grader you're going to take something different from it and so it's completely free and it takes about four hours to go through it so all we had to do was just get in cars and come over here there's no cost to it all and you know there I have a little book I got at Borders called Michigan uh, something, Guide to Kid Adventures or something. It costs about $5 and I mean it's, it's thick and it goes month by month with different things there are to do that are low cost and they're categorized and so we get together and plan these. Well, something like this in the school, this is how you get 100% attendance at family meetings where people are coming for something. You know, they say, Mom, we're going to Crystal Stair is going to Cedar Point, and you better come and get with the program so I can go. You know, the children will drag the parents there so they can participate. So I'm going to stop by reading an excerpt from my book, Unbank the Fire. Uh, people have asked me, why, what does Unbank the Fire mean? And I named this book from a sermon of my father's. This is the one that has their life stories in it. And I'd just like to close by giving this excerpt from the sermon that denotes the name of the book. And these are my father's words. Let me go back to Mississippi. I saw my daddy cut down trees. We would help him cut the trees into hard wood. Wood was a very important commodity in our family. It was used for cooking, heating the house, heating the water for washing the dishes, heating the water for bathing, and in any other capacity where heat was needed. This was the source for all the heat that came into our house. At bedtime, I would see my daddy take a shovel and scoop up the ashes that had accumulated in the fireplace. He would lay them on top of the burning flames. I asked, Daddy, what are you doing? He replied, son, I am banking the fire. These ashes will hold the fire until morning comes, O oh, glory. 
My daddy just kept putting ashes on the flames till you could no longer see the fire. It looked as though the fire was completely out. We would go to bed. The next morning, he took a poke iron and came back to the same fireplace and raked in the same ashes. Under the ashes, the wood had continued to burn slowly. There were little chunks of wood with fire on the ends of them. Oh, glory. He pulled those little chunks of wood together, matching the hot ends. Then he got down on his knees and began to blow air on those ends. He blew until little sparks began to fly. He blew until a little flame was started. He blew until a fire began to burn. Then he laid new fresh wood on the flame. The fire was unbanked. The fire began to burn. My daddy had unbanked the fire. God told me to tell you to unbank the fire. The fire is here, but it is banked. Put together your pieces of wood with the heat on the ends. Get down on your knees and blow on it with prayer, faith, and love. Blow on it until the sparks start flying. Blow on it until a little flame leaps through the ashes. Blow on it until the fire starts burning. Blow on it until the Holy Ghost comes. Blow on it until the church catches on fire. Oh, glory. When the church catches on fire, the world will come to see it burn. Then the world will catch on fire. Unbank the fire of prayer. Unbank the fire of love. Unbank the fire of faith. Unbank the fire of service. Unbank the fire. I name my book Unbank the Fire because I do not believe that extraordinary measures are called for to assist African American children in reaching their potential. All that is necessary is for this society to remove the ashes that historically and currently stunt their development and to allow what is there to come forth. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. No, I don't. How were they uh, paying for the tutoring? Did you try calling the Detroit Public Schools? I'll try again. I oh, but you already tried? I, I had trouble getting through, so mm -hmm. I might have, I probably didn't try the right number, mm -hmm. is what I'm thinking. Okay. okay. No, I haven't heard of that one. All right. I'll try to check the Detroit Public Schools. Okay. Call the superintendent's office, see if somebody up there might help you. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Uh, yes. Other books. Oh, you can get them um, at the bookstore. You know how it is. If you go in there, it's not on the shelf. They can order it. So I'm not going to guarantee it's going to be on every bookstore. But if you go to like Barnes and Noble's Borders, they can order it. And uh, you can also go on Amazon.com. And there's a website that Johns Hopkins itself has, and you can go on their website and order it from them. It's on the back of Learning While Black. The address. You're welcome. Okay, well, these are the diehards. <laughs> are you healthy? No, 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 I'm oh, Okay, you look like you're so familiar. Oh, okay, but you look um, familiar, like I've seen you before. I thought 
so. Huh? Belly has short hair like that. Oh, okay. I haven't seen her either, but. Oh, okay. I just just a wild guess. <laughs> but you do 